is not rumor. We're about to dive deep into scientific fact here. New from NASA, you've probably seen the headlines. There is now a 3.1% chance of a city destroying asteroid that could smash into Earth in 2032. It would make it the most threatening space rock ever recorded by modern forecasting. Now, a lot of, a lot of news people are just gonna like, they're just gonna say, there's the headline, figure it out on your own, be, be scared. That's not what we do here, right, Jennifer? No. We don't do that here. We don't just leave it and drop it in front of you and walk away and go figure it out. Let's get into it. Uh, joining me now is Professor Michael Pravaga, an astrophysicist at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Thanks so much for joining us here on All Day, Professor. My pleasure, thank you for uh, having me on. Yeah, so, okay, to the average person, every you know, most of us, any chance of an asteroid hitting Earth makes us uneasy. So now we see these headlines about the chances going up. It, it just doesn't sound good, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, it's you know these are very uh, fast-moving rocks, uh, uh, and and they do have potential to do a lot of damage. Uh, obviously, uh, we, our planet we evolved, life evolved under asteroid and comet uh, impacts onto the Earth. Uh, but the point is, they're very infrequent, and uh, obviously, there's something we should have some concern for. But uh, in this case, it, it looks like we just need more data before we can draw any conclusions. Yeah, definitely. So I guess a lot of people want to know about defense systems. What do we have in place out there in the universe that could prevent something like this from actually hitting Earth? Well, first of all, we've been able to, a number of countries, China, India, and of course our nation, have been able to uh, send rockets out to blow up uh, satellites that are orbiting the Earth. Uh, of course, we do have, as a last resort, nuclear weapons, and there's been films that have uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to say fantasized, but sort of thought about those kinds of implications and what you would do. Um, you know, we do have uh, the ability, we have sent uh, rockets out to uh, comets to investigate them. So it certainly would take some preparation time, but uh, we do have those kinds of, uh, that ability to blow up something in space. Okay. If, uh, if now again, I'm just gonna keep going down this road of if, 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 and we know that it's so, so small, but I, it's not every day we get to talk to an astrophysicist, okay? So I need to ask you, if an asteroid were to ever hit the Earth, what would that look like? I mean, maybe, maybe do it in context of if it hit water or if it hit land. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, obviously there are craters on Earth in Arizona, for example, that are well have been well studied and, and uh, they're obviously they were very devastating uh, events that happened before human history. Uh, in the case of this type of sized object, it would probably uh, do significant damage to a city. Uh, but remember, our surface of our planet is about 75 percent water, so most likely it would hit in the ocean somewhere. Uh, there would be a big splash. It would not be like an earthquake that would suddenly create a large tsunami. Uh, rather, it would be like a big something, big rock dropping into uh, the water, and then it would create sort of a, you know, just like a disturbance that would be somewhat of a tsunami, depending on where it uh, it hit the ocean. As far as most likely, if it was a little, you know, where it's on the lower end of the anticipated size, like about 130 feet, it would most likely break up in the atmosphere. So you'd see a big flash, and then there would be some sort of shock wave that would probably be felt some uh, distance away. Uh, but those are the kinds of three implications. It would most likely either uh, be disintegrate in the air, so it would not nothing would really significant would hit the ground, just little uh, smaller uh, uh, pieces, boulders. Uh, there would, if it hit the oceans, which would be the probably the best place, it would just be a sort of a large splash, and then there would be some sort of ripples that would uh, be formed afterwards. And then, of course, in the worst case scenario, it would hit land, uh, and then there would be some crater, and then around that crater, uh, there would be some destruction. Mm. I'm curious about that percentage number because a lot of people are going to stick to that, you know, the 3.1%. What makes that go up or down? And I'm guessing it'll just kind of keep moving as we go through the years here, right? Yeah, so I think the last data they're going to be able to get from this uh, asteroid is around in April. So they're going to keep mm. getting data uh, from this, you know, these telescopes. 
um, and the Webb telescope, for example. And so that is going to be, give, the more data you have, the better you're able to chart the course of this, uh, which is usually, you know, of this comet. If it's in orbit, it's some sort of an ellipse. And um, once you have that trajectory, then you're better able to predict exactly where it's going to hit. But again, many things happen. You have other, you know, planetary bodies, Mercury, Mars, that are going around the sun. And then as this this asteroid uh, goes around the sun, they may have some interaction. Uh, it may hit other asteroids. Uh, you know, I mean, it's very low, unlikely, but it could happen. So we still need much more data to be able to be more confident about that trajectory, about whether or not it's going to hit the Earth. Okay. Uh, Professor, I have to ask you, what what percentage number would, would get your attention? Well, I mean, obviously, if it was something maybe above 10 percent, 10, 15 percent, okay. I might be a little more concerned. But again, really, it's like, you know, the butterfly that sneezes in South America <laughs> and it creates a hurricane. We just there's so many variables in this that, you know, we are at a stage where we really have little data. The more data we have, the more confident we'll be in the probability of this asteroid hitting oh, here. Okay, and you mentioned April. So is April, you, after April, we won't be able to collect data? Yeah, so after April, as I understand it, it's gonna go swing around the sun, and then we're not gonna be able, the sun, of course, it's behind the sun, but also mm -hmm. there's a lot of light, and so it's hard to sort of de determine anything, be, follow the progress of this comet until it kind of comes back around uh, say around 2031, as, as I understand, okay. to 2032, then we'll, but by then, hopefully we'll have maybe a little bit more data in the next couple of months, and then that'll be able to better uh, ascertain this trajectory. Yeah, hopefully there's no shenanigans over by the sun uh, during that time. Uh, I think I think we all watch a lot of sci-fi movies, Professor, and I think, you know, it's fascinating and it's interesting to talk about, but at the end of the day, I mean, we see real life concerns in front of us, right? I mean, just turn on, turn on the news. There's all kinds of stuff that we could probably be putting our efforts toward that would be a little more helpful. But yeah, I mean, for example, Los Angeles just kind of, in, a, yeah. in some sense, had its own Tunguska event where it, there was a massive uh, wildfire. You know, there's so much instability globally. Uh, Chernobyl was uh, recently, uh, there was some apparent drone attack uh, attempt. And so, I mean, these are things that I would be more concerned about mm -hmm. in terms of probabilities and, and possibly of, uh, of damage and loss of life. Okay, uh, I'm gonna let you go, uh, but I have a final, final question for you, which is what is your favorite movie that has to do with outer space? You know, the one that I loved the most was uh, the uh, Interstellar because, and, and I couldn't believe it as a physicist, uh, how uh, basically how this, uh, how they were able to, pre you know, the physics. And I found out that the main science advisor was Kip Thorne, who's a Nobel laureate and who's my professor at Caltech. Oh my so yes, goodness. Interstellar is definitely my favorite. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, uh, Professor Michael Pravica, UNLV, we really appreciate uh, you just kind of breaking things down for us today. And maybe we'll check back in with you in uh, 2031 and see where we're at. How's that? <laughs> Anytime, you're always <laughs> welcome. And thank you for having me on. All right, thank you, Professor. Have a great day. Okay, All have right. a great day. Take care. Okay.